Semi-final in the winner bracket. <laughs> winner bracket semi-final, a best of five series today. Yeah, we advanced a little bit, we upgraded, we morphed into our next full and final form. It's a best of five now, no best of threes any longer. We got 30k against the Hardos, the Rive Cup, our Heroes of the Storm tournament with a 2,000 euro prize pool. And this is one of the matches that people have been waiting for. It actually was really interesting because we had the game so spread out throughout the tournament. There were so many people that commentated on matches where 30k played, where the Hardos played, and said like, oh my god. These guys, they're just like going through all the other teams and I'm like, well, yeah, because it's the early rounds and they are supposed to win. They're the favorites. This is how this works. This is one of the tournaments where the organizer had early seeding for the bracket, which means that the top teams are supposed to face each other as late as possible to make the entire tournament just flow a little bit more interestingly. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. So now that we're looking at 30k against the Hardos, we'll see who takes it. Now, just to put a little bit of context to this, as we're seeing some of the traditional bands come through, 30k was the first team to qualify for the Masters Clash. Qualifying for the Masters Clash mean you had to win one of the qualifier tournaments. The Hardos, they struggled pretty hard to make that happen. They only qualified in the fourth one. Obviously, they have some insane players on their setup, and a lot of people since then have said like, oh my god, they're the best team in Europe, the Hardos, they're simply the best. But at the same time, we haven't seen 30k play on this level since they won the Master Slash Qualifier, the first one. Because after they qualified, they didn't have to participate in one of these tournaments. So now we have the two of them go up against each other, and that's actually a pretty cool setup now, because we're getting, we get a bit of an idea if by now the Hardos maybe found that rhythm and that synergy that they were lacking in the first tournaments, or if 30k is just simply coming in here, slapping them around a little bit, and say like, mic drop, we're still the best, get the fuck out of here. So we got Sonya and Zeratu locked in at a Brightwing first pick even here on Towers of Doom. But also noteworthy as you can tell the ban against Abathur. So they're already counter picking a bit what the Hardos have played in the recent past. And the Hardos therefore got the Chromie. Normally Chromie doesn't make it into the games because she gets banned out so aggressively. Obviously not a shocker that that Benny said immediately from the get go. You know what? That Varian guy that I played for the last 10 matches. I'm gonna use that guy again. So we got Varian in, Chromie together with it. Stukov could be banned now if they want to avoid this Varian, Stukov, Chromie burst that we oftentimes see. Wouldn't be a bad ban. The only Honestly, it would be a fantastic ban to ban Stukov now. The only question is, is there something else where they say, that's more of a problem for us. Dealing with a Stukov combo together with uh, Varian and with Chromie is going to be a bitch, but you know what? Something else is just more annoying for us. And as it turns out, it's not the case. So they're just coming in and saying like, you know what, the Admiral, nope, get him out of here. Okay, so with that, we got Zaratul now in. And let's see what the red team is now gonna substitute Stukov for. Because I should point out that while Stukov was banned, another thing that is kind of important is that Brightwing is a very common follow-up if Stukov isn't available. Because after the taunt comes in, you can still pull him off the target. That's another CC that you add on, and that helps you to get the damage in. But they got uh, Yasu on Lucio. He's playing with the Smurf account, by the way. This is not a sub player that just picked Lucio for them. That is actually Yasu. That is, is his second account. And we get Urel together with Varian here on Towers of Doom. Now, Dino and Zeratul, that in and of itself is already going to be a lot of fun. And now the question, what are we going to get for the last two picks? We still need a main tank, Masquerade. Now, Frenchie, who came a bit late today with Johanna. And we got Lee Ming uh, locked in by Ultralisk. Masquerade apparently was running, so he wasn't at home at 11 o'clock. I don't know if he was running errands or whatever, but he ran a little bit late and he apparently was literally running to arrive in time. And the admin was already about to give the Hardos a death win for map number one. So it was literally just the entire team spamming. He just came into Discord. He just locked on the battle net. The admin was like, I have to give you the 1-0 right now. They're like, he's here, he's here. But yeah, there we go. Game number one, best of five series at our Heroes of the Storm semi-final in the winner bracket. We have Cassia locked in as the last pick. Towers of Doom, everybody. Let's go. The Hardos against 30k. Okay, so we got our games, our game ready, our first one. And honestly, there's a little bit more that I have to explain about the teams too. But before we're heading into that, let's introduce them first. We have on the left side, 30k with X-Ray on Brightwing, Ultralisk on Liming, Dino on Zeratul, Dequaza on Sonya, Masquerade is playing Johanna for the team. 
And on the right side of the map, the Hardos with Hazwops on Chromie, Chris on Urel, we got Bad Benny on Varian, Nick on Cassia, and Yazu is playing Lucio. So there's a little bit of confusion lately going on, especially in the live stream chats, because people are looking at the lineups, they're saying like, wait a second, I don't really understand. Uh, why is the 30k lineup different from what I've watched during the mass, uh, during the CCL? What exactly is going on here? Wasn't this or that player part of it? And what's going on? So honestly, it's actually pretty easy. Now, 30k was a team that existed in the CCL and all of those teams were draft teams, which means that the organizations drafted the players. So it was never a team where the players got together and said like, hey, want to team up, want to play, and then started to scrim together and maybe switch the player or two out. The Masters Clash, on the other hand, is a tournament format in uh, which all of the teams could form. So normally draft teams are being set up um, when you are trying to just like, you know, break the normal mold a little bit and you're trying to uh, just create a bit of a fun setup. Oftentimes when you have teams that form themselves, you have a team that is quite dominant and if you then have a draft team, then uh, players from different teams play together. So CCL did that. They used that particular style where the organizations drafted the teams. But for the Masters Clash on the European server, the teams could form the way they wanted. And so we had one team that banded together from players from Feel the Heat and washed up. And they called themselves Wash the Heat. And they immediately won the first qualifier. Now 30k as an org, they looked at this and they said like, well, CCL Season 2 hasn't been announced. We don't really know what's happening over there. And... Uh, we kind of would like to uh, maybe sponsor you guys a little bit. So they have an agreement for the potential offline event, to my knowledge, that is going to happen with um, the Masters Clash and feel, Wash the Heat join 30k. So this is why we pretty much have two different versions of 30k. We have an NA version and we have a European version. And of course, on the NA side for the CCL, a lot of those lineups are also going to change simply because many of the European players don't really want to play in the CCL anymore since they have to constantly play with a ping disadvantage, with this, which is really annoying for them. There's also the Masters Clash, which is happening roughly at the same time. So you have to really play a lot around the fact that you would have to participate in two tournaments on the same day and things like this. So this is pretty much just what's going on right now with the teams here and why there's sometimes a bit of confusion. Generally speaking, Rive Cup, the Masters Clash, those are all European events. And I feel like the best way to think about it is just like look at it from an NA versus EU perspective and you're probably going to uh, have the least confusion happen to you. Now we got a bit of a pause, but that's actually good for us because as I had to explain all of this, let's go a little bit about our talent. So uh, on level one, we got the Shadow Hunter, which already highlights that Dino is going to play this out with a normal European Zeratul build again, which obviously means that he's going to play with the Might of the Nerezim and he's going to try and get the damage in against Lucio, against Cassia, for example, over here and other heroes like Chromie, which also immediately means that Hazu is definitely going to go into the timeout on level 13. It's the standard talent for Chromie to take there anyways, but sometimes you see some of the Chromie players that play a bit more greedy, they're trying to get away with taking extra damage to go into a Sandblast talent, for example, but with Zaratul on uh, the other team, there's absolutely no way that we're going to see anything else. Especially since with Sonya here at the top, there's obviously another good chance that we get to see Leap again. You have not only Leap as as a potential tool. You also have a blessed shield that can set the initial stun up. I mean, technically, you could even see a falling sword, but I don't think that Masquerade is going to go for that since we don't have an Ana on the other side. There's always the option, but if you want to be aggressive with an engage and a stun, then leap on uh, Sonya would probably be a better option. So there's a lot of tools that they have that they can really use to apply some pressure and damage. And that will also create space for Li Ming, who then can connect damage safely is probably not going to be attacked all that much and has a perfect opportunity to get that reset. Now for the red team then again, they are of course going to play this out with the taunt that just kicked in for Varian. I'm going to try to make taunt plays and use Chromie to drop the burst damage and take the target down. So that is pretty much the idea behind all of this. Masquerade gets attacked right away and is able to make it out with the iron skin. No problem for him. We got early pressure on Varian and oh boy. Bad Benny? Yeah, he is eating a ton of damage over here. Holy shit, and that's the first kill. Varian gets blown out of the waters. Yasu is trying to escape. Nice connect here. Easy double kill as they take down Lulcio. And that is a beautiful opening. I mean, look at this one. 
first they came in taking down Varian and then they follow up and just murder Lucio. Boom, straight into the combo. He would have died even without Liming because Zeratul already connected his, uh, his Singularity Spike. 15 stacks for Cassia and the first altar phase. Uh, pretty likely we're gonna have a 2-1 trade. Of course, it's only the first map of the Heroes of the Storm series in this tournament, in the winner bracket final. Winner bracket semi-final, my bad. Since this is the best of five, uh, there's a bit more wiggle room and uh, room for error. But yep, first one has been channeled, and now the fight for the one in the middle. And here they come, trying to engage again. Taunt has already been used. That doesn't create enough space though. And they're starting to move in with another kill against Nick. And Cassia is down 30k. Crushing. Going for Bad Benny. Dropping him too. That's a quick double kill. And now we're looking at four kills to zero. And I want to highlight again how the Hardos have absolutely destroyed the opponents that they faced so far in the tournament. Which exactly resulted in what I talked about earlier. People coming and saying, oh my god, they're the best team. How can anybody even have a chance against them? Well, this is how. That doesn't mean that the Hardos can't win the series. I mean, they only lost the first objective. And of course, you can also have a draft that just doesn't work out. Maybe someone needs a game to warm up a little bit. So yeah, I'm not saying that 30k is going to win this one by any means. But you can already tell that this is not nearly as easy as a lot of people seem to have expected after the Hardos dominated the earlier rounds. Which they were supposed to. Same is, by the way, true also for 30k, for Chili Mountain and for the Donuts. They were all supposed to win their early round matches pretty easily. That's how these brackets work. That's how a tournament works. At least when it's an open tournament without invitation-only setups. So, for now, we got in the mid lane still a bit of a push. We have a one level lead, five kills to zero. Level seven talents brought us Calamity. We now have, in addition to that, also uh, the temporal loop for Chromie already. And, yep, there's the Quasar sitting tight. By the way, medallion anybody? Still remember that shit? <laughs> now that we got the temporal <laughs> loop, I uh, got reminded of that really quickly because back then it was like, oh my god, he took temporal loop, how can he? There's gonna be so many medallions that are gonna be used now. So yeah, thank god that's gone. <laughs> Five kills to zero. And we get nearly level 10. Honestly, I feel like the best thing that the Blizzard developers have done for Heroes of the Storm ever since HTC went down was to remove all of the shit that they implemented afterwards again. So, <laughs> yeah. First kill! There we go! Congratulations! Woo! Nicely done, the Hardos! There we go! Coming back into the game here. Double Altar is up. The problem is the level 10, but they should close that distance soon. There's also the Might of the Nerezim and no Leap shenanigans this time. No, 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 no. We are heading straight into the Raffle Berserker. They are not channeling anything. They just gave up 8 points. What? I mean, Zeratu wasn't really here. They were trying to hope for a kill, but I thought they would try to uh, maybe uh, stagger deaths. Don't help either. Uh, the Hardos definitely with signs of life. I expected them to try to interrupt instead of forcing a fight. They were bullied into one though, and they lost it hard. And just now that Zaratul is back, we got Liming down. That's two altars on the side of the Hardos. And just like that, the Hardos have taken the lead on points. 28 against 32. Okay. Brightwing down at the bottom of the map. I mean, they're starting to farm. Once that level 10 kicked in, the Hardos really starting to pressure. Good job by them. They had a lot of problems in the early game. Five kills to zero, that was not a lot of fun. But now that they're having heroic abilities in their arsenal, they're starting to turn things around a bit. Quest completed, off we go. Top side, that's where we still have Sonya against Urel, but the camp has been taken, so that allows for more pressure on the bell tower. And some might even make it in. Zeratul already hiding a little bit, but Benny sniffed that out at least. But let's take a look at the damage numbers too. We got Chromie, as you would expect, with the 18,000. She is the main damage dealer for them right now. Cassia might eventually take over when she has enough stacks, but that's not really the case for Nick yet. 12 to 12, 5 to 3 kills. And let's get going down here. Varian, he's been looking for the next engage. And this is why Masquerade is always like sitting at the side of the team, trying to create a little bit of a barrier between the opponent and his damage dealers. So you're trying to zone as much as possible because you are one of the few heroes in the lineup that can survive the combo from the red team. And you also have your iron skin that you can play around with. 
Even Sonya has to be careful. But it's a single ult on the map now, and this is going to tell us a lot how this fight is going to unfold now. We have... Yeah, half a level until 13 for both of the teams. There's the attack again. Zaratul, Dino is looking for the engage. Jumps in, starts to take Chris down. And is able to move away before that Benny can initiate another taunt and set him up for a kill. There's the damage on the other hand against Equaza. They're trying to go for Chris in the back. The taunt on Zaratul. Dino, he makes it out. He, they thought probably it was dead already. That's not the case. Full-on combo from Ultralisk. Hits Lucio. And that was a big problem for Yasu. He nearly died to that one, but he survives a bit long and the fight's still ongoing. Not a single kill just yet, but the battle rages on with one combo after another thrown out from Li Ming. Trying to connect the damage here. Bad Benny coming in with another taunt against Sonya. One shot, two shots. They're going for her. Nearly a kill. They spin to win, baby. Everybody's stomping into the fray. Varian down. Sonya, she's still murdering. We got the kill against Jojo. And Cassia is also there. The two for one trade in favor of 30k. They want to go for Chromie. And Hazorbs gets murdered by Dino. Three kills to one. And here's the channel. Bam. Four shots fired, Urel already on her way to the top. The shots connecting, Zeratul trying to steal the cam. 13 talents for both of them now. We definitely are going to have a fun series here. Eight kills, two four. They take the camp. They got some momentum at this point. Catching experience and not letting anything go to waste here is obviously heavily important. And that's what they're currently doing. Yeah, Chris is already pushing this out. Dino, careful. Bot lane, also a little bit more pressure since Varian is back to business. Now Ultralis can't go into deep. Once that the taunt is up against him, which is the case now. And Sonya is trying to go for the next camp. And uh, for just a moment, I thought they might even go for the boss. That would have been quite the call, but no. They have four heroes at the top lane, and they're trying to go for Urel. They're trying to bait this a little bit, but Chris is playing this super safe. His team definitely telling him already, listen, we don't know where they are right now. They might be on their camp, but now that they're figuring out that 30k is not taking the pumpkins, they are stealing them away instead. And there's no chance of a flank right now, so that attempt to take Chris down at the top and then take the bell tower failed a bit. And they lost also down here at the bottom. There's the taunt now. Against Jojo, but they're turning it against Bad Benny. Bless Shield hasn't been used yet. Still an option. And they're playing this a bit slow since the next objective is about to spawn. And you don't want to completely use all the cooldowns before that fight is ready. They Quasar also with a safe distance here. We got 42 stacks now for Nick, so Cassia is starting to get more damage on the board. She's sitting at 27,000, which is putting her into the second spot just after Chromie. And eventually, Nick is going to take over the top damage numbers for the team. We got 31,000 now for Li Ming. And there's the next combo coming in. Yeah, he's not going to taunt Jojo here. 16 talents for the blue team. And it's going to be a channel on each side. Left side, right side. Everybody's just channeling. People are getting position once again. Chris gets attacked. He's a little bit low, but he makes it out. And there's still no level 16 talent for the Hardos. They're fighting without the talent. The advantage goes to 30k, but a quick kill could change that. Dino's jumping in again, and a lot of damage unleashed by Li Ming alone. Ultralisk is again looking for the angle here as he teleports to the side. But Nick zones him out right away, and everybody is now on the way back to the next... Oh! <laughs> Ultralisk! Damn! Coming in with the angle on Lucio and taking Yasu down. Damn! Murderous! Yeah, and the boss gets taken now. They even tried to go for Chris at the top. That one won't work, but I think they can take the bell tower. And the shots are connecting, which puts the core down to 20 points against 24. What a Lee Ming connect there by Ultralisk. Nicely done. Looks for an opportunity, finds it, drops the support, and that gave them even more momentum and control over the map. Now we have them with... I mean, Liming has 40,000 damage now, easily top damage. Cassia is a uh, distant second with 7,000 damage missing. And right now, the push to the bottom of the map. Now they're both on 16. There's, of course, an even fight happening again. But it's a triple altar phase. So whoever locks two in is going to take a significant lead over the opponent's team. In an ideal world, you win the team fight and take all three. But, well, <laughs> that ain't happening. Or at least it's very unlikely. Nine kills to four, and already a bit of a trap set up. The only ones that haven't died, by the way, are the side laners. 
Chris and Dequaza, the only one that have not fallen yet. So down here, we have X-Ray trying to uh, get the channel. He is going to be met by a Sandblast in just a moment. Yeah, they're trying to go for the full-on kill and can't lock it in. Top left, top right have been channeled. Varian was looking for the taunt, but Bright being jumped out. Hazu gets attacked. Nice taunt against Zaratul. And he makes it out. Oh my god, Dino. How is he still alive? X-Ray with a save. Dino with a juke master. And he can't dodge all of it. He dodges most, but eventually he dies. And so does Brightwing. The Hardos fighting back tooth and nail in this game. Masquerade. He's also getting a bit lower. They really want him here, but I'm not sure they can get him. I mean, I guess eventually he's going to fall. But are they going to take too much damage because of the Bell Tower? No, they're happily engaging into it. The channel has already happened. Bell Tower gets converted. But at the top, we see the same happening from Dequaza as he's starting to hammer this one down. So it's four Bell Towers against four still. The advantage still goes to the Hardos. 16 to 16 stacks, but they have bot lane control, which allows you to push both of those uh, pumpkin camps towards the core. And Ultralisk is here immediately because he wants to prevent that from happening. And he wants to catch the experience. Everybody is, of course, now waiting for the level 20 talents next. Damage output has significantly increased for Liming in particular, but also Cassia has started to catch up a bit more. And some of the shots even get fired. 16 to 15. Here's the fight, though. They're looking for the engage. Dino, careful. And Dequaza gets saved by X-Ray. Brightwing jumping all over the place here. The fruit fly is active today. It's mating season, apparently. Nine kills to seven. And the push into the mid lane now. More wave clear delete from Dino. Bottom of the map still controlled. Next pumpkin camp is up. Both with even experience. I like this already. We've been waiting for these matches to happen. Both of the semifinals and the winner bracket are going to be great. In the second one, uh, Chili Mountain is facing off against the Donuts. But I'm very happy with the start into uh, this series too. This is exactly what we hoped for. A battle on eye level between two of the top teams in the European scene. All of them fighting for dominance and the, uh, uh, well, the title of champion establishing themselves at the top. Right now, these are definitely two out of the top four teams, but where do they stand exactly? The bot lane pressure with the pumpkins, that's still a problem. 30k, if they don't send someone in to deal with it, they're going to eat the damage. And indeed they do. So the pumpkins are making it in. And that is uh, three shots that are now fired. Easy points. But they're trying to go for the altar instead. That's a bit more important to them. They got the level 20. And there's the interrupt. And 20 is ready for both. Which means that, of course, once more we got the storm talents available. The Quasa, the spin to win. The sound barrier has been used already. The jump on Dainu. They're controlling Zeratul so well. They take him down. They take Sonya. They take Brightwing. They kill everyone. The only one that fights back a little bit is Ultralisk. But even he falls. Huge battle and huge fights now here. On the side of the Hardos. Great performance by them. And they get the shots connected right now. But damn, what a fight. And it turned quickly against 30k. Zeratul is controlled extremely well by the Hardos whenever he makes an engage happen. And then once Brightwing starts to jump in in order to help him out, they focus the attention to Brightwing, drop her first, and that allows them to take another Bell Tower in the middle, quite likely. 11 to 10. They let this one pass because the next pumpkin camp is up, so they can create more pressure at the bottom. 74 stacks now for Cassia, and that's 60,000 damage. Starting to come in at the top damage now. Yeah, tons of pressure, and you can also see it. I mean, Jojo, I think, even missed the blessed shield in the last fight. Masquerade maybe is still a little bit tired from uh, running to arrive in time. But with 8 points to 16, the boss that is about to be claimed is another huge problem for 30k because now they're missing out on another four points on their core. And they can't contest this. They didn't have Liming back up, and down here they needed to deal with the pumpkins. Boss is now taken, shots are fired, top bell tower has been converted, they're retaking the bottom of course, so it's gonna be four to four points, but that still leaves us in a situation where a single altar is ending the game in favor of the Hardos. So, yep, right now, single altar is popping up and they're all looking for the engage. Urel is there, they got the vision. 
Here comes Dino, gets immediately attacked by Chris, starts to make the jump forward. They're looking for the quick kill. They have to fight the fight, and they know it too. They're trying, but Dino gets attacked again. They are on him completely. Gets healed though, and again the red team on the retreat. They were trying to get the kill against Zeratul. They couldn't make it work, so instead they are falling back towards their own fountain, and they take it. They top their hit points off, they top the mana pool off, and they're re-engaging into the fight. X-Ray needs to be careful. In the back, the engage at the front. Bad Benny waiting for the taunt opportunity. Dino jumping in, dishing out some damage, moving back out. Guerrilla tactics all over the play. 10 to 11, the kill count over here. 83 stacks now for Cassia. She's chipping in more and more damage with the Lightning Fury, and they are pushing the blue team back slowly but steadily. Hazops, Hazops gets interrupted, but there's Saratul. He had to jump in, he had to interrupt the channel, but they were waiting for him. And they locked him down with the taunt, and that is the end of Zaratul and likely the end of the game. They are hardos, they come back, they drop the early game. Five kills to zero for 30k at the beginning of the match, but now they're turning it around. They got the kills against Li Ming and against Zaratul, and they are about to end this game. The focus onto Sonia. She's still fighting it out with Nick. Nick goes down. Can they hold this? Doesn't seem likely. With Sonya eliminated, X-Ray is still alive, but Johanna now died too, and they're going for the five-man team wipe as they take Brightwing down. They go for the channel, and that is the 1-0 lead for the Hardos, everybody, as they take the first game in this Heroes of the Storm tournament match. The best of five at the Rive Cup, the winner bracket semifinal. Before we head into game number two, make sure that you subscribe to the channel if you haven't done it yet so you don't miss out on any future content here on Calder TV. The Hardos with the lead 1-0 everybody. And yeah, that is pretty awesome. Battlefield of Eternity is our second map and I like it. That was a cool map. That was a real nice opening. Early pressure from 30k. They got a huge lead in kills. They had 30 to 0. And then at some point, uh, sorry, 5 kills to 0. And then at some point, you could really see that the Hardos dealt way better with Zeratul. And whenever Brightwing was jumping in to just save Zeratul after a taunt from Varian or something, they shift the targets really quickly. So there were a lot of really cool plays from the Hardos. A couple of smaller mistakes already being made on uh, 30k side as well. But of course, that's all what this is about. You're trying to force mistakes on your opponent's side so that you can exploit them and the Hardos did exactly that but it was a nice back and forth here the entire time and that game could have gone either way now I'm happy that this is the best of five series the only thing that I want out of it is at least four maps five would be better but if you give me four then I'm already a happy panda and with Battlefield of Eternity we of course have also now a very different playstyle we got the ban on Medivh again pretty sure that he's going to be insta banned on every single map always by the second team not by the team that has first pick because they would likely lock him in Uther gets banned out too. And what do we get on top of that? You have to think about, again, do they play that variant style? Do we get to get rid of Stukov? Is Chromie a hero that you don't want to deal with? They actually get rid of Chris's Urel right now. Okay. Yeah, Chris's Urel gets banned out. And that leaves us with the same question, this time for the Hardos. Do you want to get rid of Chromie? Is there something else on the other side that you don't want to deal with? But a Chromie ban would be expected. Yes, and there it is. Okay, there we go. All right, Chromie gets banned. Now with that, what are we going to get as our first pick? Are they going to try and make a play around like Sukov composition? Are we going to get some engage from them? Do they focus a bit more on uh, the Sonya pick again for the side lane? I mean, again, she's a staple right now. Super strong with all of this too. Okay. Yeah, and uh, then for uh, the Hardos, are we gonna get that Varian? Uh, Bad Benny has been locking in Varian over and over and over and over again without fail. And if he can't get Varian, he plays the new <laughs> It seems like it's the last two heroes that he's play gonna play for the next couple of weeks until we have new patches changing the meta. And he has Anna and Diva. Okay, so Anna and Diva, we're starting with a double Overwatch setup for them. And then the next big question is gonna be. Uh, what is the tank? Because now, I mean, technically speaking, you could pick one, ban the other, so there's a couple of options for 30k. 
if they want to not up go up against something like that. With Anna, of course, you have also changed the pace a little bit. It's not like we're seeing some Brightwing or Stuka follow up on any kind of stun with the Nubarak or Varian Torn. So you're already aware of that, but you have to think about what could get Nano boosted here. Now, the first thing that happens is that Nubarak gets picked and we get the old man together with him. So that's a little bit more control and zoning. Good stuns for a noob. Could still go into an aggressive Sonya leap if you draft a third melee. If you want to play that style, we've seen it in this tournament. But it seems so far that they're sticking it out more with the Wrath of the Berserker. Bans, that's the next big question. Now that you picked the Nubarak, are you still worried about that Varian? Or do you just say like, yeah, whatever. On the side of Bad Benny, we could also see that Garrosh that he played multiple times. Tracer gets banned so that Dino can't zip around them six days to Sunday. And trying to take this one. But, yep, now that we get our last ban. Now they have to face off against the question. Frontline or what are you going to ban out? Are they more worried about... Yep, they ban Varian. They picked the noob, they banned Varian. Exactly as I said. That's an option they have and they used it. Now, Anna can still come in and, for example use nano boost on a Liming. Liming would be a good one here that you can take. Would also burn down the cocoon on a Nubarak, so that's another big tool for her. When you're talking about the front line, Bad Benny could easily play Garrosh, as I said. Could also just simply head into a, a Jojo or whatever. And ooh, they go a little bit slow on this one. They got Thrall and the Rexa. Triple front line. Triple bruiser. Okay, so very likely not going to be a full-on melee for that. Not going to be um, another melee for them. Might shift one of the plays around to Nick, but that is already an interesting lineup for them. So they're going into the Bruiser setup where you play three of them instead of just having two frontliners, and then you can get away with not picking a main tank. Ultralist takes Li Ming, so that's already good for them. That eliminates one of the nano boost targets from uh, the Hardos, and also it makes sure that nobody can burn your cocoon down. That's a pretty good damage setup that we now have for 30k. They got Li Ming for Poke and Cassia. Dino, of course, yes, he loves to play Zaratul, he loves to play his Tracer, but he's also been known for quite some time now for his Cassia plays, and he has shown it over and over and over again with some incredible stacking that he has. So now that we're heading into the last pick, what's it gonna be? My F! Full melee! Damn! Now, that can work, but there are a couple of downsides that come with this, a couple of weaknesses. If you commit to a fight, you're committed to the fight. There's no backing out anymore. So if you're in, you're all in. If you start to fall behind with this lineup, you're done for. And they know that too. But let's check it out if they can make it work. Battlefield of Eternity, everybody. Game number two! And we could be off to a real interesting one with a full melee setup that the Hardos are playing here. We have on the left side of the map 30k with Ultralisk on Liming, X-Ray on Deckard Kane, Dequaza on Sonya, and Masquerade on Nubarak. Dino's playing Cassia for the team. And on the right side of the map, we have a Nick on Maev, Bad Benny on Thrall, Yazu on Ana, Chris on Diva, and Hazu on Rexa. This is one of those typical games where hindsight is going to be 2020 for uh, all the uh, NFL uh, Monday morning coaches because this is a game where if the Hardos win and it's like, oh my god, they're brilliant, what a cool idea. This is such a that's such a cool thing. If they lose, it's like, oh my god, how could they ever have expected to win this without a range damage dealer? <laughs> but yeah, obviously, as I said during the draft, if you play a comp like this, you gotta overrun your comp uh, opponent. You have to really pick your fights well. You cannot just simply take damage from the range damage dealers the entire time. You have to stay at a distance and then when you see an opportunity, you have to make the snap call, come in, get the kill and then just snowball it. Make sure that you're really gaining momentum and using that for your side. If you fall behind, then you are in a really problematic situation because, as I said, you gotta commit when you wanna fight. You have no way of actually moving out. So when you start to fall behind, your opponent is gonna pressure you the entire time and is gonna slowly start to poke you down and you will just sit on the receiving end and you can't poke because you don't have a lot of range. Now they have a couple of tools. It's not like they have nothing. They at least have the chain lightning on Thrall. He went into trolling thunder. But Chris at the top has already died as they ganked up on him pretty heavily. And well, there is already a little bit of a setup now. Bottom of the map, that's why we got Bad Benny, we got Dino, they are currently soloing this one. Nick is coming in and if he lands the tether and Dino would be great for him. 
But the camp at the top is now taken. Blue team could rotate some of the heroes back down too. And yep, we'll see what they can pull off now. But this is gonna be a bit tricky for the Hardos if they can't make work the first and second objective. It's all about momentum, honestly, here. And it's about not making mistakes that your opponent can exploit. This could be one of those games that looks incredibly one-sided, but is just decided in the early game. But of course, if the Hardos get what they want here, they're gonna have that back and forth. For now, we have at the bottom of the map still that rotation. The camp is taken, at least one. You can see on the minimap that there is continuously small traps set by 30k as they are trying to rotate in, flank in, get a kill. Yeah, already a bit of a check and the stun for Masquerade so that he himself doesn't get locked down. And they're starting to poke again. They're going for Misha, take her down right away. The idea is to, of course, get a kill against Hazo if they can. But there's the engage with the Under King now. Also, Trumford is in. The shielding potion has been taken. And we get the full slam set up as Cassia is using Misha also a bit as a bouncing ball to get more stacks together for the level 1 ability where we're currently having Dainu on 10 stacks. Well, 9 to be exact. So, yeah. But alright. On the right side of the map, now that we got also the Grizzled Fortitude, a bit of a different setup. Frostwolf Pack is in for Thrall, so it's going to try and get the stacks connected here. And therefore, the uh, reduction later on in the game, once completed, cooldown and mana is always kind of neat when you can reduce that a little bit. Gives you more sustain during big fights. Talking about sustain, there's the lockdown, but Masquerade is able to make it out. And that is kind of what you can expect from the Hardos. I mean, it didn't result in the kill, but this is pretty much the MO. They see a chance, they collapse on the target, and they try to take it down. That Benny down here, he barely made it out. But of course, that entire wall is now getting attacked heavily. But at the top, they are also counterplaying it. And a kill against Sonya is what the Hardos get as their reward. So it's a kill versus a kill now in total. But a 5 versus 4 on the map, which means the blue team has to fall back a little bit. So bot lane. Dino still trying to play this against Bad Benny, but the red team has an open shot at some immortal damage. And Nick is already looking for the next engage. He wants to go for Deckard Kane. The old man is, of course, a priority target right now. Sonya is back to business. Liming is doing damage at the top and is trying to make this an even battle. And she is also able to help them to take at least the halftime show victory. So good for them. Yeah, nicely done. So with all of that said and done, Here's our one-to-one -one setup, and let's go. Nick with a tether, but no stun from the Immortal, all right. It was a good idea, but it didn't quite work out. They played around it. They Quasar moves away with 50% HP, but Benny zones them too. It's, of course, a very hit point heavy setup that the Hardos currently have here, so that's definitely a problem. And they're still poking it. And the red team is losing their Immortal. There's so much poke, and that's something that the Hardos just simply don't have. So another combo connects from Li Ming, trying to get more in. Ultralix connects the missiles. They're trying to make a play for Ana. Yasu, he's dead. Yasu is dead. The Immortal is taken, 50% shield, and now they're on the run. Now they're starting to make their move over here, trying to get Hazu Ops. They're trying to lock him in. They can't, but they can take Misha. Level 7 talents are ready for both of the teams. With that, we get Calamity, of course, and on top of it, for Thrall, more importantly, the Ancestral Wrath. But Benny even completing his level 4 at the 5 minute mark. The top lane, that's getting attacked next. And of course, you don't have the range damage now. So this push is not too shabby. Nick is the one who has to make the engage and really set the kills up. And he does it. He does it. He comes in with a tether, and they can take Cassia down. These are the engages that they have to use. But the wall has fallen, and the fort is taking enormous amounts of damage. The kill against Cassia might save it, but it's still going to be incredibly low. Two kills to two in this game now. And off we go. Bottom of the map, Sonya working on the next camp. And yep, very heavily back and forth right now. <laughs> eight versus eight on the levels. Okay, let's have at it. Ultralisk, more damage coming in at the bot wall. Red team is all stuck at the top side, so they can't do a whole lot here. And here comes the next quick attack, trying to take the fountain down. But there is a rotation coming their way. They know that, and they don't want to get caught by it. But let's have a look at the damage output. We have 12,000 for Liming, nearly sitting at the 13k. 11,000 for Maiev, and Diva is sitting at 10k herself. But that's pretty much what I've been talking about here. 
No, they're diving in. They want to get the kill, or at least the fort, and they get it. Catapults are now going to pressure. Bad Benny. The rest of the team is moving in. But as I've mentioned, they need to fully engage if they do, and they don't find the proper angle, so instead they're just moving back. And you gotta give a bit of a shout out to the Hardos there too. They play with a draft that is not necessarily super easy to play now. It is quite beefy and we've seen that already. A lot of this is gonna come together when level 10 hits of course. That's true for both teams but I suppose even more so for the Hardos. And here we have it. Deckard Kane will have to do a whole lot here. To stop the, uh, the onslaught. So heroic abilities are in. That gives us for now. Not only the stay a while and listen, but also the ball of lightning and the cocoon. But they're sundering now. There's the Eye of Horus. And we get the cage on my F. So they got a lot of tools that they can use in this next big fight. And they're going to try to sync all of that up to get those snappy kills. Come in with a couple of stuns. A good side engage, for example. Flanking them. And then taking multiple kills after that. So already the commitment towards the objective as the top lane is visible. Ultralisk makes it out, gets barely touched by the Sundering here. But that could have been a kill if he connects it a bit better. Or if Ultralisk would have played more aggressively, but he knew exactly what he has to pay attention to. The Quasar is moving in, they're trying to go for my F. They're putting Nick under pressure and Nick is down. That's a big tool for them. And it was it's, it's one of the biggest tools, the best engaged tool that they have here. And Nick dies. That is such a big blow to the Hardos that 30k immediately initiates, goes for more, they take down Thrall and that was a brilliant setup, a great engage and it yields results. Four kills to two and it's not only an easy halftime show, this is likely going to be a full immortal for them. At the bot lane they can dive this one as well, if they get, a, if they get another kill here that would be such a disaster for the Hardos. Hazu is already zoned out a bit, but he makes it out as Nick re-engages. They're trying to chase Dino a bit. He's at 34 stacks, but the fort is gone, and now they can go for the Immortal. Both of the forts have been destroyed already. That is just nuts. Here's another hit. The Immortal is slowly falling, and the only thing that the Hardos can do to bring it back is come in with a kill or two. And they're trying. They're looking for it. The Tether is there. Nick is low, and he jumps out, but the Quasa, they're focusing him heavily. Masquerade on the side. He could make the engage. Has four seconds before he has his cocoon back up. And the poke just continues. And that Immortal is not going to make it. So they're just five-manning it. They're not trying to take it. They're just trying to reduce the shield. Stop the bleeding as much as you can. 5,000 hit points, the difference now. The shield isn't huge, but it's there. But the fight gets forced with a cocoon. The old man! The old man with the boomer box. As he comes in, yells at everybody, and they take the kill on Ana. Thrall is down. That's a double kill. They nearly got level 13. And now we have a big push topside. What a setup here for 30k. Game number one, the Hardos, they turned it around in the late game. But now on the second map, 30k, they are they're out for blood. They want this. They want this series. They want to prove once again that they're the top dogs in Europe right now. And that the Hardos might have the, well, the star power, but they are not really a match yet. So right now the top four falls. The Hardos, of course, looking to somehow bring this back. Maybe flank the back line, try and take it down here get that Sundering in and set a kill up for the team so that they can slowly bring it back and win the game, take the 2-0 lead in this best of five, but instead the keeper at the top falls and 30k they are playing some fantastic Heroes of the Storm right now very few mistakes by them and the quick pressure plays against Nick in particular, they are yielding dividends really nicely done Nick is the one that will try to set... There's two heroes pretty much that are trying to set up the kills most of the time. It's either the Sundering from Thrall that you gotta deal with whenever he gets a good angle, or it's gonna be Nick jumping in, tethering you up, and dropping the cage. Those are the ones that are really dangerous. Everyone else most likely will only go for follow-up. It's a bit unlikely that Misha is the one to make the first initiation. She's usually the second stun to come in. But they're playing a Masquerade here at the bot lane again. Could force the fight, has the Cocoon back up. Already getting the cocoon in against Ana, forcing the battle. Rest of the team is moving in. Can they get the stun? There's the first one. Sonia is deep. And that's a double kill. Easy peasy double kill. Crushing through the opposition. And Hazu Ops is isolated at the bottom. They're trying to go for Ultralisk. Oh, who makes it out? Hazu, spoiler alert, doesn't. 
And that is that. Yeah, the explosion comes through. But take another quick look at that beautiful double kill that kicked things off. They forced the fight around the cocoon against Anna. They needed to try and defend her. And then the play is being made and Maev plus Anna both die. Two levels ahead, seven kills ahead, but Yasu with a big hit gets the shot in, takes Cassia down. So at least they got the counter kill here. Nice! The Eye of Horus plays again. Well done. Very well done. But again, they're still far behind. The level 16 talent when the Immortal spawns is going to be annoying. The kill against Cassia is worth a lot though, because the Immortals are already here. And Cassia is still down for another 10 seconds. Now, that might give you the halftime show. If you're lucky, it's not going to give you much more. Of course, they still want level 16. But if there's now a kill, if they can actually stagger deaths here, kills against the blue team, that would be the dream for the Hardos. That could be the ticket back into the game. Right now, they are not getting that. And the 16 Talons are already. Cassia is back, so they were able to do some damage. But they now have to fall back and take a defensive position around their own Immortal. Or well, it's going to be an even bigger problem. Yeah, easy attack here. 9 to 3. Damage at the bot lane. Careful. The Sundering. And Jay Ming is dead. There we go. That's the angle that Bad Benny was looking for the entire game. But they lose Hazu. Hazu is down and Bad Benny's in trouble. Bad Benny's in trouble and Sonya is on the move. Nice connect, <laughs> but the spin against Diva, who literally ran into Sonya here. Mayev died, Rexa did, bit of a B-step down there, but of course the situation doesn't really change, they're going for the bottom keep. Now up at the top, Bad Benny is on the run and eventually he's going to fall. The old man, yep, that's going to be the end of Thrall, that's a staggered death. 37 seconds until Thrall is going to be back and Masquerade has already taken to the bot lane to take down the keep itself. Cassia is defending the top board. They haven't lost a single major structure yet. And Noob should make it out here. Yeah, it's bird charging uh, easily away. And the halftime show has been taken out in the middle too. But what a game. What a game by 30k. And yeah, the composition for the Hardos just doesn't work out. It's a difficult one to play. If you get the lead, if you can run over the opponent's team, then you will be able to snowball this a bit, but right now it is not working out at all. They get some good flanks in, but it's just not enough. The damage output, 45,000 for Sonya alone, 34,000 for Cassia. And you look over to Liming, for example, she's sitting at 31k. But Sonya, of course, she is doing so much damage here. With the AoE that she can bring to the table, when we have these clustered up fights, she is really the go-to champ for the damage output. But in comes the 16. So we got 16 versus 16. It's going to be a play for game. Both of the keeps have been eliminated. Nice! The boom box, the boomer box comes in, and that could be a kill. The cocoon saves Thrall for another day, and Nuburak is down. That's a problem. And they might defend this. And the Immortal is already on its way to the core, and it's going to do damage. The question is just can it take the entire thing down? Now the blue team is of course still chasing this, they still want to do a bit more damage here and therefore not everybody can attack the immortal. But the shield on the immortal is already about to fall, Thrall at least is down, good kill by Sonya. They're coming in for more and they want Nick. They go for Maiev, Hazu is also low and the core is losing hit points as we speak. Hazu feigning his death here with Rexa. the core is falling though and the longer this lasts the smaller the chances of the hardest to defend this and at this point they're non-existent. This is the tie in the Heroes of the Storm series as 30k locks in the win on Battlefield of Eternity. Sky Temple, game number three. We get a series on our hands. The combo not really working for the Hardos on uh, the second map. They were trying something a bit different with this triple, actually quadruple bruiser style. And it didn't work out the way that they were hoping for. Now we're heading into Sky Temple. So pretty much what we did through all of this, we reduced the best of five to a best of three, if you think about it. Now starting here with Sky Temple, more or less. And yeah, it's gonna get interesting because I want to see how the Hardos react after the last strategy didn't work out for them. We have a 30k with quite a bit of momentum after the last map. They played this very, very well. 
but I expect that the Hardos are now relying on a more normal strategy for this game. I would still think that Mediv will get banned, not by the Hardos, they would probably love to play him, so it has to be a ban from 30k, since the Hardos have first pick, but there's the Uther ban immediately. Lucio gets banned, no zipping around, no speeding up rotations between the lanes, and being annoying around the boss fights or whatever, but I'm pretty sure that the second ban has to be Mediv, there's just no other way that they're doing anything else. Now, on top of that, the bigger question is what do the Hardos ban out? Because for them there's a bit more wiggle room on what they want to get rid of. They have to also think of, of course, what they are, what they want to first pick, because now they have a chance to pick Chromie first. Yeah, there gets the Brightwing ban. So what should happen? Mediv gets banned, Chromie gets picked. Kinda what we should see here. Unless one of the two teams thinks, yeah, you know what, screw it, we'll just changing up a little bit, we can deal with that. But normally, and considering how long they're waiting, they might switch it. But normally you would expect the Mediv ban and then a Chromie early pick. Not happening right now. Okay, so let's see. They ban Varian. Alright, they allow Mediv. Mediv is up on the map and can be played. Okay. Sonya as a first pick. That kind of switches everything up a little bit. Now you can still see stuff happening around the third ban. But yeah, Sonya gets locked in immediately. You have for Sky Temple also to be a little bit careful about bosses just in general. Because oftentimes you will see one of the teams throw a Hail Mary around the boss spots if you have some control spells or some heroes that create space there. That is incredibly impactful. One of the reasons why Falsehood is also so popular here, not only because he has the global and all that side lane push, but also why because he has the gust available for that situation. I mean, Diva comes in and she can also push targets away and really try and control that space here. Stukov is in a similar position. And the pick on Stukov with the bans on Uther and on Brightwing also mean that if the Hardos pick an Uberak, it's not going to be as much of a problem as it could be. But Stukov, of course, on the side of uh, 30k means that the Hardos are well advised to pick an Uberak for themselves, which they do now. Then again, if a team has a killer comp, you can still go Mediv, but it seems that both of the teams are moving away from him, actually. And we neither have Chromie picked either, so it's not these standard comps that we've seen for the last few weeks. They're both moving away from that slightly here on the map. And this is, of course, a map where you can also rotate around the opponent a little bit more. But, yeah, let's see. Vikings! <laughs> Every single time I see Vikings ban, I'm sad. I don't think that Haza would have played it. I mean, he can. He can, he has. But uh, it's just always sad because, like, if, if you see the... If the Vikings don't get picked, nothing's lost, right? But if the Vikings get banned and not getting picked because they are banned, then you're always sitting there like, could we have gotten the Vikings? Did we just miss a Vikings game? It's always just a sad moment for me. And the Vikings feel sad too, they want playtime. Oh no wait, that was just... Anyways, uh, there's a Jojo ban. No Jojo for Masquerade. He could go Dibbles Medivh if he wanted to. Leyline into Apocalypse, and I say that mainly because Masquerade is a mean Diablo. Of course, you want to play him more so on Inferno Shrines, but still. Can set some nasty combos up. That, by the way, would give you also a lot of control over the boss point. There's Mediv. Do we get Diablo together with it? We get Zul. Main tank Zul as an option. Okay. Yeah, but Mediv still makes it into the game. <laughs> Ultralisk, of course, also a solid Mediv player. It was a bit later the pick that I expected it, but yeah. We still need the support for the red team, so let's see what's, what Yasu is going to pick now. Kind of throws me for a loop a bit that he has his Smurf account today. We got Nick finally on his main account, not playing the Hans account anymore. And then Yasu came in and was like, you know what, I think there's a we have to at least use one of our Smurfs. And they go Lily! Oh boy, these guys clearly spend too much time in North America. Lily in as our only support, solo support Lily. Looking for adventure. <laughs> I did not expect that pick at all. <laughs> this is gonna be fun. Uh, Dino, last pick. Let's see what Dino's gonna take. Orphea. Coffin Girl. Game number three, everybody. Sky Temple. Let's go. Our third map in the best of five series at the Heroes of the Storm tournament here. The Rive Cup. Yeah, let's head in. This is going to be an interesting one, to say the least. It's party time. Let's head straight into map three. For your 
All right, so he would prepare our dear boss announcer, whatever, on Sky Temple. I want to prepare too. 30k is playing a Medif composition, and the Hardos decided that the way to go is Lily. So we'll see how that works out, because so far she does have a pretty poor track record. But obviously they're not just simply yoloing out a pick here, so that must have worked in scrims quite nicely for them. Dequaza here on Sky Temple is playing D.Va. We got Ultralisk on uh, Mediv, Dainu on Orphea, X-Ray on Stukov, Masquerade is playing the Zul main tank setup. On the right side, Chris on Sonya, Nick on Phoenix again, Hazorps on Tychus. We got Yasu on Lily, and last but not least, we got the main tank, Bad Benny. On a Nubarak. <laughs> Good damage against Nick already. He's like, team, get me out of here. And they're helping him to escape. But yeah, the Lily setup will be very, very interesting. So we got the Wind Serpent on level 1. And I'm a little bit shocked to see here. Lily was played during the CCL a bit. But honestly, there's a lot of the games that were played in the CCL that were pretty clown fiesta. Again, the ping delay... The problems with the uh, cross-server play from the Koreans and the Europeans didn't make that any easier. And then of course there was also a big mix in meta, so it was always a bit strange and some of the games were just like, eh. But right now, seeing her in the home environment with zero ping, that will make it interesting. Because I want to see if that's really working out for them. As I said, they're not just simply YOLOing out a pick. So that must have been something that they not only thought about, talked through, but also something where they said, hey, let's try that in a scrim and see what we can do with it. And yeah, time will tell. As a solo support, it's definitely interesting. Second support, could have seen it a little bit more, trying to come in with the double support setup. We've seen a lot of those recently too. So not happening in this case, but yeah. For now, we got the Siege Giants taken. That's true for both of the teams. And of course, the Bruiser camps are taken too. Which means that now Medivh's job is to uh, ensure that there's nobody trying to invade, to just provide a bit of vision. He also wants to continue stacking, which he does against Nick. A to the baseline. Has to be very, very safe here. And talk about safe, uh, Nick. Ho oh, that could have been a problem. The portal is back set up to threaten him even further. And Yasuo is still dishing out a little bit of damage as he commits to the surging winds on level 4. But heavy pressure at the bottom of the map. All about taking structures down. Take the structures down as much as you can. And see what he can pull off here. The stacks are coming in for Tychus. Of a boy within the rhythm. Top vision is now taken by Dequaza again. And they gotta be careful at that side lane. Because Hazops has been rotating over and helping Sonya out a bit. 17 stacks for Medivh. That's pretty solid, actually. Ultralisk is getting good stacks together. If he can complete it early, that would be great. Chris might be in trouble, but Bad Benny and Hazu are both rotating in to help him out, so it was a bit of a bait there, too. Chris still low, but everybody is just now starting to dive in for this one. With Medivh around, nobody should really fall on the side of the blue team. It's an Uberak instead that dies, and Dequaza makes it out easily. The bug is dead. Ah, Medivh. I was surprised that he wasn't banned. I was really surprised. At least at the third position, ban him there. And on the other hand, is a nice counter kill, at least. The good thing about this is, of course, Medivh can't ruin your place when Medivh isn't around. So she at least, he needs, needs to be close by. But we have a kill for a kill, and the objective is now up. And top side gets taken by the blue team, middle of the map. That's where the red team is taking position for now. And here we go. Seven talents will soon be ready for the two of them. And with Stukov around, there we got it. Okay, the Hardos with the level seven. Lily coming in with a let's go. And on top of that, we also get the Warp Warfare now. And a bit of a skirmish happening at the top as Chris is saying, you know what, I'm going to try and at least secure a couple of these shots here. So far, that's not the case. And Chris actually gets zoned. Ultralisk is trying to help with the kill. They can't work that in. But they can still easily move away from this. And Zul is now rotating lanes. And if you paid any attention to the games that we have seen in the Rive tournament, you've probably seen already that some of the games that were played with Zul on the side lane were incredibly difficult for the opposing team because of the wave clear that he provides and how much pressure that translates into when you're pushing those waves out. Now they are making the dive for Lily. She's still trying to escape here and likely able to make that happen. They're diving a bit deep for my liking and they're getting punished for it. Yeah, it was a bait all along. 
of fear is down and that was them getting a bit too greedy around the kill. Initially, that made sense, but they just dove way too hard for it. Grenade build for Tigers. Hazops and his boys, they're going for the fort in the middle and they're committing to it. And they get it. So good for them. Ophir is back to business. Went into uh, the Mind Devourer on level 7. Has a single stack to it. Talk about stacks. 27 now for Medivh. 13 and he's going to be fine. But, yep. Experience lead, of course, also for the Hardos now. Not a lot of big fights happening just yet. It's more attempts to get a kill on one of the side lanes and making some plays. And then, of course, the immediate counter aggression. Day Quaza, is he gonna get out? Yep, he's able to make it away. Gets a little bit of a pew-pew going over here as the teams are focusing on Siege Giants again. And already attempting to invade, but the timing works out really well for the Hardos. They had their own camp already taken by the time that they wanted to rotate over. And this is where you gotta be really careful now. There's a half level gap, level 10 is in. And as long as you have Cocoon on the other side, there's always a chance that Anubarak is gonna force that fight. We've seen that in action on Battlefield of Eternity for 30k so now they are on the receiving end of that setup but as you can tell 30 versus 30 now and with that we got the massive shove coming in and the ley line is also ready also follow that up with some damage one camp taken at the top right and uber was checking the top left to see if they go for their own bruiser camp which wasn't the case so now it's only the red team that is pushing the top lane. But at the bottom of the map, has a lot of damage done through those Siege Giants and the commitment that 30k made here. So they will suffer damage at the top because of the camp that was claimed by the Hardos. But they set the bot lane up a bit better. Question is just, can they really work this now? Now Medif is sitting at 31 stacks. He really wants to complete it here. But this will be an interesting fight down at the bottom. Both of the teams still have a fountain. Nobody was able to take the fountain down on the other side. Sonya and Diva both at the top. So this is going to be a 4 versus 4. Leyline, he gets the angle. There's the combo. And Lily is dead. The panda is down. She was looking for adventure. And the only thing that she found was a painful death. 35 stacks for Medivh. We got 17,000 damage on D.Va, who successfully defended against the top camp. So now the shrine at the bottom goes over to the team in blue. And they're taking the four down with the help of the shots. D.Va is still sitting all the way topside. And Ophia, of course, can easily move away now that Ultralisk is signaling, Hey, listen, there's a couple of players coming your way, so be careful about that. Ford is about to fall. Stukov, he might fall too. <laughs> I don't know why he stayed that long. I... Okay. There's the cocoon. They might still get the kill. Medivh with the help, but he might still fall now. Yeah. Grenade. Azu. Yes, the kill is there. Honestly, it's their own fault. Medivh had perfect vision of all of this. And they just said, hey, I can get out with the help of Medivh. But nope, not really happening. Not when Anubarak just said it's cocoon time, baby. Instead, Ultralisk is now playing here with his baseline completed. So that's nice for him. Doesn't have to be afraid anymore of dying. The problem that we have for the Hardos is that the top lane fort is now going to fall. Because that thing is already low and guess what? Sonya is going to be slowed down by Dequaza. There it is. So that means this thing is dead. This thing is not making it. Then again, at least they're getting the bottom of the map. So it's a fort for a fort that they're pretty much trading. You can already tell that they're rotating more heroes over since they are hoping to get a kill on Chris. 13 talents are ready for both of the teams now which gives us the mass vortex for Lili. And you gotta be careful around the boss now too. That's another one. And that is really where a lot of these talents come into play that can control space. And that's mainly Leyline, Cocoon. So there's a couple of tools for both of them. They're trying to force the fight here. Stunned by the boss. Okay. I don't think that they're going for it. I was aggro there a bit earlier. They had the mages up of course. And they're pretty much disengaging immediately. Uh, going to their own siege giant camp. Now that they're realizing they get, don't get the easy kill. It's an interesting game though. I mean, we expected that, but it's cool to just see this. The entire series has been awesome. Two kills to three. We have 14 to 13. Both very, very close in experience. Masquerade, where's the siege damage at? 68,000. Eh, not quite on the level that we're seeing from Sonya here. Not only does she have the top hero damage on the team, stacking it against D.Va in the one versus one at the top all the time, but we also got 94,000 siege damage. And of course, that is pretty impressive there. But, again, the next temples are activating. This is a double temple that is now going to spawn. 
And it's all about the kill setup now again. No talent advantage. No level 16. I level play from the two teams here. And let's see what they can do. They need to first of all defend the top. <laughs> That's the first thing that has to happen here. So yeah, there we go. Boom. Yeah, they got the level 15 now. It's a trap. Bad Benny could go for the cocoon. They try and force this. Medivh is around. Yeah, not yet. They're trying to go for Zul instead. He turns it. Jailers are in. And there's the portal. Can easily escape. Everybody seems to be focusing into the middle. And 60 could become a problem at some point. Because we're still half a level away from it. But it takes some time until you get the last few temple shots in. And the bottom of the temple is... Uh, the bottom temple is completely ignored. So they are all focusing on the team fight here. And here comes the engage. The ley line to isolate the back. And the old on of fear, but Coffin Girl gets Cocoon. The Quas are rushing out, creating some space with the bomb, just as Hazu committed to Odin. They're taking over on the temple, at least for a couple of shots, but not for much. And the fight isn't over yet, not even close. Everybody's just chipping in some numbers. 16 getting closer and closer for the Hardos. And the blue team engages again. The Salvo connecting with three. Dino is low. Masquerade, they're all about to die. The portal, the shield. Chris, he gets out. The kill against Zul. Diva is about to fall. The Quasar is on the run. The spear connects. That's the double kill. And they're looking for a Coffin Girl. The portal. And she's still trying to make it out. They go for Bad Benny. And the noob got wrecked. The noob is down. And they're still able to move past the gate to tap the fountain. This is not over yet. Three kills to five. Both of them on 60 now. Epicenter for Anubarak. And they are back to business. With Zul coming back in a few more seconds. Structures, the advantage goes to the Hardos. They've taken all the forts down on the blue team side. And now with the move down to the bottom of the map, they're starting to threaten the keeps. Could be a fight here. Nick, hello. <laughs> they're going for Hazu. And that's a kill. They nearly got Phoenix. They go for Hazu instead. And Lily gets crushed. Yeah, Yasu can run, run around a little bit longer, but that's a double kill. And oh boy, that one hurts now. Boss is up and boss is closed. They go for it. Here we have it. 31,000 damage for Orphea. Top damage for the blue team. 37,000 for Sonya. The camp at the top right. Claimed by Bad Benny and his boys. But of course, the boss is up for grabs. So are the Siege Giants. Both Siege Giant camps. This is going to be an incredible push through the bottom of the map if they get everything set up here. It's a boss, it's four Siege Giants, and they can murder with this. Now, we are also seeing some camps stolen away at the top, so both of the teams are setting up some serious mercenary pressure. Masquerade, he's going to see what happens. Now, the shots at the bot lane still get fired, but let's not forget there's still a fort in the middle, and they got to defend against the double bruiser camp now. As does the red team. They need to, to make sure that that boss is not getting too pesky down there. The two siege shine camps also a nuisance. But yeah, the defense is there. Zul is slicing and dicing. Dequaza is sitting here. Zul already moving away, helping the rest of the team out. Couple of shots still for Dino at the bottom. The fort is finally down, taking the fountain apart. And now the damage through the bot lane. Siege shine is still there, but they're not going in. So thanks to the double camp that the Hardos set up at the top, this didn't hurt that much. They opened the wall, but they couldn't get the keep itself. This would have been a total disaster if the two bruiser camps wouldn't have been taken by the Hardos. There would have been no pressure at the top, and 30k could have simply said, okay, let's push with this and end that keep. Stacks for Tychus, not really that good, by the way. 40 in at the 14 minute mark, it's not that great. He didn't get a lot of opportunities to stack it properly. Uh oh, uh oh, 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 careful. If he gets locked down, with a violent reaction, then he is in trouble. And he gets locked down now, and they are trying for the kill. Cocoon gets used, Bad Benny still has the cooldown, but he makes it out. They let him off the hook too easily. They thought, oh, this is a typical example of people just moving away when they think they have the kill, and then the target is able to escape because nobody puts in the finishing blow. That could have been a kill against the Nubarak. It should have been a kill against the Nubarak. It had to be one. Now, ah, 20 is close. We have an even game. 
There's a slight advantage, of course, from structures for 30k. But generally speaking, this is an even game. Five kills to five, experience is similar. <laughs> yeah. You win one team fight, and this is likely yours to lose. Yeah, off we go. 40,000 damage. Sonya still running the numbers here. Single temple at the top. One temple. And there it is. Medivh is cheating again. Has the upgrade for the ley line. And full on setup with the mortal wound now. Spectral sight build all around for our boy. And the ley line is, of course, back to business. The only ults that we're waiting for are the salvo for Phoenix and Zul skeletal mages. And then they're Gucci. Portal is up. And they're immediately moving away. Yep. No capture. Ultralisk is there. Going full bird mode on them. Getting the vision. And now the shots are getting fired at the top. And of course the red team has to react. The hardos. They're looking for an engage. Ultralisk is signaling everybody. Listen guys. They're coming. Get this set up. Because they're on the way. And Chris is leading the charge. They're trying to push in for the point at the top. Down here. Maybe a play for Bad Benny. Dino. Uh, tries to connect some damage, but Chris is taking over topside. Down here, the stun is out. Connecting one, all right. Could we engage also? Epicenter's, of course, available. They are trying to make the play for Stukov. Leyline! <laughs> in the middle of the transformation. Can they get the damage in? They're trying to come through with the damage on X-Ray, and both of the supports die. Lili is down, but so is Stukov, and Nubrak made it out. Can they kill Chris? Chris and Nick, the two damage healers, they're trying! <laughs> and the Unconquered Spirit saves Nick, but D.Va dies. Everybody is so low on the side of the Hardos, but they're able to survive. Yeah, Dino wants Nick, and he can't get him! Oh my god, Ultralisk is also in trouble. Here comes Masquerade, but four have fallen, and the Hardos! All of them low, but they come in with the momentum now. They are trying to end that keep at the top. Even if they have to fall back at some point through the temple, they can take it. And in an ideal world, they would end the game. But they're all low. They're all low. And they don't have a support with them. Can they really make that happen? They're incredibly low, but they are just hammering it away. And then Chris, in particular, is doing so much damage with the Sonya setup. They want the game here. Seven seconds for Zul. They're thinking about it. They're coming in. Masquerade is trying to stop them, but the core is starting to lose hit points in just a second. Now Hazel's in trouble, but there's the cocoon. Zul and Uberak is dead, but the core is about to fall. Oh, Stukov! He's coming in. They're taking Tychus. It's only Sonya, but that is enough. It is game. Game the Hardos with a victory clutch win on Sky Temple for the red team. Infernal Shrines, game number four. The Hardos are in the lead now. 2-2-1. Two, two, yeah, we had a bit of a longer break right now. Apparently Masquerade went for a bathroom break. And honestly, after... He was away for quite some time. I got a little bit worried about the boy. I don't know what exactly happened in that bathroom, but I definitely don't want to clean up after him. Let me put it like that. So obviously a TMI, a little bit too much information, I know. But if I have to go through that, you have to go through that. Okay, Medivh gets banned. Shocker, I know, I know. You, you are shocked. You don't understand what's happening anymore. You're looking at this like, wait a second, what? So yeah. Even though they won the last map, you don't want to go up against Medivh again. And it's like, nope. You try that once, and then you're just like, okay, we kind of remember now why we ban that guy all the time, so let's get that out here. Now we got Diva banned, we got Medivh banned, and the Hardos are obviously in the lead, so if they win this one, they move on to the next round of the tournament, the winner bracket, which would then be the grand final. The winner bracket final, my bad. The losing team still has a chance to make it to the grand final. This time we're correct on this one. Through the lower bracket. There's in total there's 2,000 euros on the line. The ban on Kromi. Yeah, a little dwarf gets slapped around a little bit. And what are we getting from uh, uh, Zehados? Okay. Utha. Well, that's one of my favorites. Calls him Ufa. Anyways, take Quasar with the Sonya first pick. Does that surprise anybody? Sonya, monstrous, Chris. Honestly, Chris alone on the last map won them the game there. At the end, when the core was attacked, if they did maybe kill Sonya first, if they could have, 
they might have been able to defend. And then you can snowball it to the other side. So that was incredibly close. The hardest with a really good call. They won the fight at the top, and then they said, guys, I think we got this. I was skeptical. I was very, very skeptical. I really thought that they might be able to take the core down to, let's say, 20-10%. But I thought that there was a good chance that the red team or the blue team gets their heroes back for the defense in time. Especially given how low all of the blue players were when they engaged and that Lily was missing. I mean, she was dead. So now we got Varian. Also, not really sold on that Lily pick, I gotta say. They won it. But again, there's always then the question, did you win it because or despite that particular choice? Not really sold. Now, was she totally useless? Definitely not. But was that really the pick? Could have that been a little bit easier for them with a different one? We'll see if they, it gets chosen more in the future, but I'm still a little bit skeptical of that particular one. But again, now that we have Varian again and Tychus, you already have your chunk combo taunt into the bigger they are. Technically, you can also still play it within the rhythm, but the bigger they are, if you're trying to deliver the damage there, it's kind of neat. We got Cassia and they got Kane for the other side. Mayev gets this time banned out, another hero that Ultralisks plays, of course. And what are we getting from... Uh, yeah, what are we actually getting from uh, 30k now on the bans? Could ban Stukov. Problem is you have Stukov up, you've got Brightwing up, so there's a lot of CC on the supports that could be an issue for you. But with Varian, that's something that you always have to at least consider. Or you could ban the side lane. But they go for Stukov. Stukov is just a beast on Infernal Shrines, no matter how you look at it. And on top of that, with Varian, it's just one of the most deadliest compositions that you currently have in uh, Heroes of the Storm and the meta. I mean, Varian's taunt was always like the go-to talent and the best talents on a competitive level. Never has anything else been picked. It's the one thing that you gotta go for. But Varian himself just always felt a little bit like on the side. He had some killer compositions that were played with him. But when Blizzard came in and said, you know what, we're actually making him a little bit beefier, a little bit tankier. All of a sudden he became a tank that he could actually play. And now you're playing tons and tons around that taunt. So uh, Chris comes in with Leo, and we get Lucio for Yasuo again. Okay, so with Yasuo now in, left side, double pick. Mm, Ultralisk and Masquerade. Yeah, main tank of course needed, but what is Ultralisk gonna pick? He's a bit the X factor for the team. Gul'dan! Gul'dan and Jojo for Masquerade, okay. Yeah, we get good done for this one together with Cassia. Good AoE. Really good AoE for the shrine. Horrify also, of course. Can destroy a lot of the players here. Has to be a bit careful that he doesn't get attacked by Varian because that could become a problem very, very quickly. Now, Nick, the last pick for the team here on Infernal, and it is Hanzo. Hanzo plus Tigers as the Honor. damage dealer from a distance. Honor! <laughs> Infernal Shrines, everybody! Could be the last map of this particular Best of 5 Heroes of the Storm series. You're still at the Rive Cup. 30k against the Hardos. Let's check out if 30k can force map number 5 or if it will all end here on Infernal Shrines. Let's go! We are on Infernal Shrines, everybody! It is time to party. And over here, as you can see, we got in our game on the left side X Ray on Deckard, Kane, Dino, and Cassia, Ultralisk. Is a plain Gul'dan, the Quasar on Sonya, and Masquerade on Jojo. On the right side of the map, Chris is playing Leoric. We have the Hardos with Bad Benny on Varian, Nick on Hanzo, Yasu on Lucio with his alternate account over here, and Hazorps is playing Tychus for the team. So, it's party time. Let's get the show on the road. We got stacking for Gul'dan and also for Cassia. Not a surprise for either one. Also, since Renewal comes in for Leo. And on top of that, we got the grenade build for Jimmy once again. With the laws of hope for Masquerade. <laughs> the skirmish in the middle. Yeah, everybody committing to the five man. Nobody dying yet. But let's see what else they can do here. Top side, that's where we have our one versus one. The rest, the four man, will rotate between the lanes and look for some value there. Yeah, Gul'dan over here. He is a little bit of a linchpin. Can he land that Horrify that they're going to uh, need later on in the game? Or are they going to lose this one and drop down into the lower bracket? 
This was one of the most anticipated matches, honestly. I talked about this uh, before game number one. The Hardos, they have definitely shown a lot of great games. But 30k, they won the first qualifier for the Masters Clash. So a lot of teams have said, hey, they are the guys to beat. But since then, a few weeks have passed. And as I highlighted in the first draft, if during all that time, the Hardos now finally found that synergy that they were lacking beforehand, then they might just take the number one spot in Europe. And right now, they're looking good. It's a uh, hard fought series. It's not like one team is dominating here or anything, but this is the chance to bring it back and -ho -ho -ho. jump, Hanzo, jump. Yeah, that was a close call for him. If he gets caught there, then he is dead. Nick barely made it out as is. A lot of pressure at the bottom. They actually changed the MO that you normally have with the camp. They went for the bottom first. Nice engage on X Ray. He's dead. X Ray is dead. The old geezer is down. Alright. Uh, the boomer remover over here. Easy kill, and they're going for Dino. There's the taunt. That's another one. I mean, I don't know what you expect, but if you are just like sticking around against that setup and they're hitting level 4, what do you think would be happening here? So, 30k starts off into the game with a couple of small mistakes that immediately get exploited by the hardos. And yeah, they, they really need to buckle up a little bit. Dig a bit deep and make sure that they are turning this because now they're also in danger of losing their fountain and indeed they will. So that's a lot of good moves made by the Hardos now. Not only do they get the two kills, they steal the opponent's camp away, they can still take their own, they remove the fountain from the middle. And that is going to be uh, very, very annoying. It's an annoying position to just play from. So Dino is starting to take the camp at the top, but they really need to... Yeah, they need to dig deep a bit here and try and play this through discipline or it's going to be a 3-1 victory for the hardos and then 30k has to play through the lower bracket and of course that's something that you really really don't want to do either way we got again the taunt here in the middle masquerade should be totally fine has of course to activate the trade in the meantime Yasuo is just pissing off everybody that is rotating towards the top and dropping them off the mound to slow the rotation successfully I might add Sonya still at the bottom but slowly moves towards the top too and they get some extra damage in as Masquerade is taking over on the objective but this is now 19 stacks to 9 so there's definitely a lead for 30k Bad Benny jumps in deep that's so far without any consequences. The early level 7 on the other hand is kind of nice for 30k. They have Sonya coming in slowly but right now it's a 5 versus 4. Uh, Sonya joining the fun. Trying to go for the kill on Bad Benny. The taunt but it's not enough. They can't follow up on Cassia. 7 versus 7 now. 36. Chris is going to take it. Chris is going to take that Punisher now but they want the kill on Lucio. They're diving in for it. They want the kill. They want at least Lucio, but the Punisher is going to chip into the fight in just a second. That jump is going to get procked in another moment. The taunt on Jojo, and that is kill number three. Third time that they kill a hero, the Hardos. A lot of momentum from game number one, and they are using it now. Three kills to zero. That top keep, that top fort is definitely down. Sonya has started to rotate between the lanes at the bottom and the middle immediately to catch experience. But first Ford gets removed. 8 versus 8. 3 kills to 0. And there it is again. Another move. Another taunt. And potentially another kill. Yep. There we have it. I mean, it is pretty much the standard setup if you're going for a variant taunt combo and the speed of Lucio enables them to rotate between the lanes a bit faster. Sonya didn't account for that and she gets punished now once that you're getting out of this death spiral that they're in now they might be able to bring it back but they need also the level 10 and you can see that Bad Benny is just setting up another potential taunt so it's gonna be the MO of the game the taunt plays at least until level 10 and the quick kills afterwards now the interrupt on Nick okay might have to have storm back again if he still wants to get his mana back Leo is now up at the top and at least they're taking the camp down here. So game's not over, but you really got to get your shit together here. 30k is making too many mistakes that they need to avoid, small ones. And the loss of the fort at the top is a nuisance, but it's not like they're way behind in experience. The problem that we're now going to see is that around level 10, when they're trying to make the play for the second uh, Punisher, it's happening in the middle of the map. And it's a problem because they lost their fountain earlier. Now there's the level 10, the timing is perfect, good engage, there's the Entomb, Cassia is going to die first, 
and a beautiful timing for the hardos around their heroic abilities and they get a double kill with it. 30k is dropping the ball. The hardos, fantastic timings from them. They get the early level 10 and the difference in level 10s was how much? 5 seconds? 10 seconds? Something between the two? And it led to two kills. The moment that they had the level 10 about to hit, they engaged into the fight, they forced it, they quick picked their talents, used the hotkeys, bam, came in, get the kills, and now they're level ahead. So, 30k, they can't make mistakes like this. The margin of error on this level of play is incredibly small, and the hardos, they have definitely found the rhythm. They might have been struggling in some of the earlier maps a bit. Won some of those, lost the second. But now they are just playing out of their mind. The synergy is there and they make it look easy. It's just like click, click, dead. Click, click, dead. Time and time again. So right now, what 30k needs, they need a kill first and foremost. Maybe now, they try to go for Bad Benny. They got their level 10, so now they have a chance too. But there's a wedge driven between them. They go for Ultralisk. The old man with the sleeper setup. Ultralisk is low. There's the Horrify. At least they killed Lucio. Lucio is down. It's a four versus four now. The support is gone and they could try and bring it back here. Shrine is activating. A lot of ults have been popped. Pretty much everything with the exception of the sound barrier and the Entune. Ten seconds for the Shrine to activate and the spin to win. And of course now, this is the problem. No fountain. Which means that Deckard Kane has to move all the way back in order to pre-tap. And now they can re-engage into the fight. If they can get the kill against Tychus, that's the dream. And they get it. They get the Tychus kill. That one was important. Now it's going to be a 5 versus 4 once that Gul'dan is back. And maybe the Punisher. They're bringing it back slowly. Ooh, but they have to work hard for this one. Okay, good poke. Good poke now. Uh, Hanzo, 10 seconds for the arrow. 20 stacks to 8. And Tigers is going to be back in 4. But I think the Hardos are going to give this one up. They got the level 13 now, though. But yeah, they're trailing too far behind. 32, 34. It's going to be a Punisher for 30k. They're going to try and delay it, though. So that Sony has some time to get the experience for them. But I think they're going to be threatened. They have to take this one earlier than they thought. And there it is. The Frozen Punisher is taken. And with the Punisher, they're now going to make a move to the middle. 13 or no 13, they got to do something here. Sonya is hoping to get the experience so that they can, at least can fight with the same talent. But they're not, you need to do something here for sure. Leo's baiting it in, baiting it in deep. The towers go down and the Frozen Punisher is, of course, always a beast. Sonya gets caught. They knew she would rotate down and they try to get the kill. But Benny and Hanzo couldn't chip in enough damage so they can't get the kill. And here comes the fight. Five versus four. Hanzo is defending the middle. And that means that Varian dies. All of a sudden, oh, the Valkyrie connects but he gets dropped in the wall instead. <laughs> middle Ford likely to fall and 30k is making their way back into this one. Okay. Some close calls though. I really like the choice of the Hardos to split two of their heroes to intercept Sonya when she was making the way back into the mid lane. But it didn't really work for them. And as Hanzo stayed in the mid lane to defend, it was a 5 versus 4 that unfolded afterwards. And that resulted in Varian dying. So now the momentum is a bit back in the hands of 30k. But it's more or less even. There's some extra damage at the bottom of the map in the fort, but generally speaking, it's still 7 kills to 3. Level 14 to 14. The main damage on Hanzo with a 26,000. 24,000 for Gul'dan. And it's a fun one. It's a huge problem at the beginning. Initially, it was a huge problem for them. Now they're baiting him in a little bit deeper. Hanzo with the arrow, connecting with two. Dino also low. Bad Benny in trouble. And Bad Benny is dying. He dies again the second time that he falls and they are chasing. They want another kill. They try to go for Lucio, poops them back. Gul'dan with extra damage, but they cannot follow up with another kill. They're always getting one and then the Hardos disengage successfully. But now the bot lane is open. And that's where you can drop another fort. That's where you can take the fountain down. And that's what they're going for right away. Okay, in the meantime though, what do we get all the way up at the top? That's where we have Chris fighting off against Dequaza now. All right, slowly but steadily, trying to get a bit of damage in. 15 versus 15 now. Next objective, once announced, going to be fought over there too. 37 stacks at the 11-minute mark for Sonya. Well, 
for uh, Cassia. <laughs> not quite the same, not quite the same. Cassia is a little bit prettier. Okay, so, a little bit less, less bulky. Doesn't go to the gym that much. Or, well, maybe goes to the gym, but doesn't lift weights to that extent. No, Sonya is just beasting it. Like, she's bench pressing hard, you know that. Uh, okay, so. Now, a girl here is just slamming it out with a double war axe over there. Also, of course, now with a giant slammer on level 16. Yeah, trying to make the play again with the Valkyrie, but that didn't really work. 16 talents are finally in, and they got that lead now, but not for long. The Hardos have their own talent. A bit of a poke. Rune's Affliction now, of course, in for Ultralist, but he doesn't have his level 1 completed yet. Yeah, the taunt, but Masquerade gets away. Yeah, completing, honestly, that would be amazing for him. If Ultralist could complete his level 1, that would be great for the fight on the Shrine. He has 34 stacks, and that's just not enough. And here we go. Right now, there's a little bit more poke happening. Everybody is just uh, jumping over towards the camp, claiming that. Mithril Maze for Leo. And this is a bit of a moment of truth setup. Again, the advantage through the fountain for the red team. The Hardos, they get the advantage through it. And here comes the objective. Masquerade is moving in. The two tanks are sitting at the side. It's all about vision now. Try to go for him. Bad Benny! Bad Benny! Oh my god! They crush him! Bad Benny gets murdered so quickly. Hazel is committing to Odin already, but in a 5 versus 4 without Taunt, which is your entire setup, there's just no way they're gonna get this one. They will have to fall back. Look at Leoric, he already moved into the middle. He knows that they can't do anything here. Damn! He got completely caught off guard there. They just collapsed on him time and time again, and honestly, this is starting to become a little bit of a theme. He died three times. The last three battles that we saw between the two teams ended with Bad Benny getting crushed right at the beginning. And that led to the victory afterwards. Now they're going for the fourth at the top. They take it and they can push towards the keep now too. What a quick kill. These are the, this is exactly what they need to do. Decisive calls. See an opportunity, make the call, and then everybody has to be on the same page. Everybody knows what they're supposed to do. They come in and they get the kill. They open the wall up before the Punisher is there. He gets baited a little bit deeper, but this keep is in trouble. It's a 5 versus 5 again. Bad Benny is going to be looking for it, but now he's of course starting to play a lot more passive too, because every time he pokes his head out, the blue team plays whack-a-mole and takes him apart. There's no way they can save that keep. The question is, can they now get kills? Because if 30k gets a kill or two, then this is over. There's the Horrify, and Hazo gets out. Good ult from Lucio. The old man dies, though. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Ultralisk is also dead. That's a double kill. And they go for Masquerade. Tigers, at least one counter kill. The Punisher jumping in, and they get Hanzo. <laughs> the Punisher, the taunt on Masquerade, and he's down. Punisher just jiving and going straight in for another kill. Dainu on the run. Lucio's gonna get him. They're gonna five mine wipe them. Yeah, Dequaza gets attacked too. Five-man team wipe. Only three of them are still alive though. So the question always remains, what can you do with this? They got the five kills in. They have a lot of experience on the lane. I don't think they can take a lot of structures, but they can for sure now make those camps their own. Yeah, they're going to claim them one after another. But the keep is down. The keep is down and the catapult pressure is going to be there. They're hoping for some damage in the middle of the map. 42,000 damage on Anzo, 38,000 for Cassia. Zero deaths on Leo. Chris is just playing it wrong. I mean, he doesn't activate his trait at all, he doesn't use it. And I'm reliably informed that if you don't use your trait, you're not, you're not really playing your hero to its fullest potential. So Chris, I mean, I'm sorry, those are great numbers that he's chipping in, but zero deaths. Where's the trade value, bro? Where is the tra trade value? Do you even die, bro? Apparently, no. Do you even trade? No. Level 20. There we go. Buried alive time. Yeah, now it's a party. Buried alive, bullseye, and the bossa nova. Together with a big red button. Big old upgrades for them now. Okay. Both of the teams will have the level 20. Top keep. Bit of an issue. Because the next objective spawns at the bottom, which is the furthest removed from the top. Duh. Meaning, top lane color pulls will eventually become uh, an issue that they have to deal with one way or another. So here we go. We got our level 20. 
respect the elderly. Yeah, I can already tell you, Decker, they're not going to do that. They're not going to respect you even in the slightest. Haunt is in the Econon Pain too. And let's go. 7 to 12. Their kill count. <laughs> Next objective. It's got a silo. And by the way, these camps, super important now. If you can somehow play around those camps and push the top lane, that's great. Bottom fort, honestly, that doesn't matter right now. There's no fountain that they had anymore. The fort wasn't really a big deal. So it's more about what you can do around the top lane, which is what we're seeing here. Someone has to deal with the catapults. You got to push those back. I'm a bit surprised they're taking it this early. Shrine is activating now. Maybe they just want to force a fight here. The problem is, of course, that you have some tools that work really, really well in that choke point. But at the same time, you're going up against the Buried Alive and against Tigers with Odin. So, eh, gotta be careful here. But with the way that they are rotating, they will get the lead on the objective. So they have the earlier position. The camp gets just now taken. Of course, Leo is trying to force this back. But the objective is not only announced, but they can now claim it and maybe get the first 10 points without even being in the battle. Okay. Yep, they get the first few stacks quite easily. The team fight is unavoidable. And still, quest not completed for Ultralis. Quest for Gul'dan is not done yet. Very early big red button as they're making the play here. Varian is at the front again. Ultralisk is hoping for more stacks. He's sitting at 38 right now. Might be able to get it. Big shots are fired. Valkyrie misses. 39 stacks for Ultralisk now. Getting the quest completed would help them so much over here. He's trying. Arrow. Arrow gets sucked by Sonya. All right. They are getting the Horrify. The Buried Alive misses. He missed the Buried Alive. No, the backline in trouble. X-Ray is low, but the double kill against Lucio and Varian. Both of them down. It's a disaster for the Hardos. It's an absolute disaster. The Frozen Punisher gets taken by the blue team. They go for Chris, and Chris is incredibly low. Yeah, he goes down. And now they're going down to the bottom of the map. Look at that engage again. That was the play, the big one to be made here. They came in with the setup and the kills. They're even chasing a little bit more. But of course, it's a problem at the bot lane. Sonya is already on it. She's starting to weaken the wall as the Punisher is coming in. The side lane has been taken. They can go through the side wall now. Top side is getting pushed again. They want to go for game here. You don't want to just take the keep. You want to end it all right here, right now. Sonya with the big moves once again. 50,000 damage on Cassia. 53,000 for Hanzo. All three are still dead. Leo needs to get back too. And they are coming in for the damage. They want the core. They want game five. Guys, we're going the full distance. We're going the full distance. Nick with a great arrow, but that doesn't mean anything anymore. Here comes the play. The old man once more with a the setup. They're trying to make the play of four Tigers, but the core is falling. This is game. We're going to game number five between 30k and the Hados. The final map, we're going the full distance again. Uh, 30k made it happen. Uh, ladies, we're going to Dragonshire to determine which one of the teams here wins this series and moves on to the winner bracket final. Okay, 30k is already checking this one out. And on uh, the first ban, we're getting Uther right away. So first pick, first ban goes over to the Hardos, which means that, of course, it's 30k who decided which map to uh, should be played. I mean, there weren't really a whole lot left, considering that both teams had, of course, also maps that he, they could ban out. And, well, let's have a look. There's a ban on uh, Chromie right away. Now, again, we're centering every single time we're heading into this with how the teams play and what their playstyles are. The questions at the center of all of it are, of course, more or less the same. We are looking at this and we are asking ourselves, okay, what, play, what happens with Varian? Uh, what happens with a hero like Stukov? Is Medivh getting played? Is he getting banned? Would expect that he gets eliminated again. But here comes the Sonya ban, and if a team needs to ban Medivh or wants to ban Medivh most of the time, it is the team that has a second pick. Medivh is strong enough to have a first pick potential, so the team that doesn't have first pick is usually the one that needs to bite the bullet and say like, alright, we're gonna ban him out. But since 30k is delaying that ban, we could see something different from them. Are they really allowing Medivh to be played? They are! 
they ban Diablo so that the ley line can't be played with Medivh, so that it's, well, that the ley line apocalypse combo can't be played. But they are throwing a little bit of a different style at this, because now Hardos have to also make a choice. If they don't pick Medivh and they value something differently, maybe for their top lane, maybe Varian again, maybe a support here, then Medivh could be picked in the first rotation on 30k. That throw a curveball. That ban on Diablo definitely changed the MO. And they go for Lucio. They go for Lucio, who can, who has portal control against Medivh. And now, of course, the question. I mean, you're already accounting for that when you are not banning Medivh. You're thinking, okay, what are the two options? Either they first pick him. If they don't first pick him, do we do it? Yes or no? And of course, now, if you don't pick Medivh in that rotation, there's still two more picks before we're entering the next ban phase. And if the Hardos commit to him, there's that. They let it go. They let it go again. We are playing a game of chicken now between the two teams. This is map 5. They're playing a game of chicken. And with a pick into Karazim, there's a few other options too. You can play Abatha on this map. We've seen it multiple times. Karazim has been played with Abatha a lot. Or you could go in A style and you pick a Sylvanas together with him and you try to gain a mind control into a 7 sided strike. So also again, game of chicken continues. Medivh could be banned now. Last time that we saw him, he was picked on the, a late position as well. But here comes Jimmy and uh, Nuburak also. Jimmy and Nuburak both. <laughs> Jimmy can, with uh, his radars, really well scout all of the bushes out. So that's really awesome for him. He got a lot of vision. And Nuburak, of course, still for the dive. Phoenix gets banned, okay. Next two picks are, of course, on the side of the blue team. <laughs> Do they allow for Medivh? Rexar, great on the map. I mean, again, Rexar is obviously the king of Dragonshire. As I explained many times, he wins the top lane against anybody. The problem is not like he doesn't win the one-on-one -on -one in that sense, but he wins because he can control lane plus shrine at the same time and other heroes just can't do that. So as long as nobody rotates up to help out, he will control the shrine at least. In the long run. Uh, well, there's the Medivh ban. Okay, so this time... This time they're banning him. <laughs> the game of chicken has ended. The Hardos have said, alright. Well, let's have it. But here, here we go. That, so this is where you just like follow up. I mean, up to this point, I think they're probably happy with what so far happened. Medivh didn't get banned out. They go for my AF for Ultralis. It's something that they usually are not getting. And we got Imperius back to business. Imperius gets now locked in too. Haven't seen him for a long... Well, actually, we have seen him once or twice, but not really in a position where they said, like, hey, main tank Imperius, let's commit to him again. He has been falling off a bit. For a long time, he was just, like, the pick that you got. But now we got Imperius and the quick double pick on the other side. Perfect day for me. All right. Junkrat and Deathwing. Yeah. Junkrat and Deathwing are both in, and that brings us to Dainu, the last pick for the last map in this best of five, everybody. Yeah, here we go. Dragonshire is the last map. This is the final draft for the two teams. One of them is going to drop into the lower bracket. The other team will move on to the winner bracket final. We had a great Heroes of the Storm series in this tournament between the two teams already, but this is where it all is going to end, at least for now. Leo as the last pick. Triple front line, full melee pretty much. They are trying to do what the Hardos did on Battlefield of Eternity. <laughs> okay, let's go. Game number five. They're putting it all on the line here on Dragonshire in our winner bracket semifinal. Let's go. The final map, Dragonshire and 30k goes full melee against the Hardos. X-Ray on Karazim, Dino on Rexa, Dequaza on Leo, we have Masquerade on Imperius, and Ultralisk is playing Mayev. 
It is a similar setup to what we've seen on Battlefield of Eternity when the Hardos used a very similar style against 30k and they failed with it. Now 30k heads into the last map and they say, you know what, we can do this a bit better than you did there and we're going to win this one. On the right side, Hazorps is playing a Junkrat for the red team and we got them now with Bad Benny on Anubarak. Chris is playing Deathwing, Nick on Reyna and Yasu is playing Lucio. Let's go. Can the blue team do what the Hardos weren't capable of pulling off? Nice move already against Masquerade, and that's an early kill. Really well done by Junkrat. He came in quickly with the damage here, but it was the mine, of course, that set all of this up. Really, really well done. Was able to isolate Imperius, and if you're getting thrown into the towers this early in the game, there is obviously just one result, and that is just you dying a painful death. So the red team is taking a small advantage here. But of course, the same thing also happened in uh, the previous game, where honestly, the Hardos had a significant lead on uh, Infernal Shrines. But slowly and steadily, especially after level 10, the team in blue brought it back. This is also a map where there's a lot about control, a, lo a lot about sustainability. Talents, as usual, standard talent, Iron Fists. I mean, again, if you're seeing a Karazim, it's always Iron Fists. Nobody really picks Transcendence anymore. I guess we've seen one game in one of the earlier rounds in this tournament where Transcendence was picked, but if you're seeing it at a high level, it's always about the Iron Fists here for the hero. Also, towards Jimmy, of course, in this game, it's the ace in the hole that you're relying upon. Junkrat is going to be specking. I mean, for Junkrat, honestly, he needs to get those isolation plays going because he's going up against a full melee setup. So that's going to be very, very important. The teams are now both making their moves for the camps on the left side of the map. Siege Giants have been taken, but you try to follow up with the quick picks into uh, yeah, into the, the, um, the mercenary bruiser camp. Uh, in the middle, you got to be a little bit careful. The problem is really that you have Leo now also at the top lane together with the uh, with Rexa. I mean, top lane is a problem in and of itself if you're playing with, against the Rexa because you can't hold the experience and the shrine at the same time. Rexa is always able to do that, and that's your biggest issue. But it's all about the Dragonite for now, and of course trying to get some value out of the camp pressure that we, the teams are starting to establish here. Quick rotations down to the bottom of the map now in an attempt to get a few more of the shots connected here. Right now, that's not really the case. Ultralisk is eating a bit of damage. Nick, careful. Double control again at the top. Good drain against Hazu. And the Dragonite is taken in the middle. The rotation made it happen. They got the control. <laughs> and Lucio is still on the run. He's gonna survive. He's gonna make it out. But the Dragonite is active. And he's not the only one that is dishing out the damage. At the bottom of the map, we're having two heroes push in. And now a third one even joining up, so they are able to do some structural damage as well. And this is a decent opening now for the team in blue. They're doing some solid work here at the structures, taking one after another, so good for them. The entire mid wall has now been opened, and Leo can of course rotate around Junkrat and make sure that they're not losing experience at the top lane either. So they're pretty diligent about all of this. There. And down at the bottom of the map, Ultralisk is looking to see if he can maybe connect the tether and help the team out to set a kill up. They got the early level 7, so a slightly new experience is also in play for them. And at the top, it's still our 1 versus 1, where the Quasar is missing a drain against Hazu. It's only the early game skirmishes and moves that we're seeing from the two teams, but it's already looking pretty okay for the blue team. It's not a big advantage, but at least for now they're doing well around the objective. They're controlling the lanes well with the experience and not losing out on anything. Their camps have been taken. The Hardos, of course, got the only kill in the game so far. But the one thing that we still have to watch out for is level 10 abilities in particular. By now we're on level 7 and the kill has happened. So they got at least one. Junkrat was again able to isolate a target. And it doesn't really seem like the jump out helped. So this is two kills already that Hazu was able to set up thanks to the mines. So we didn't really see any fight kills, any aggressive plays made. It's only isolations into structures that have contributed to the kill count. There's a level 7 talent now in play, as I already said, and off we go. Because right now, what do we got? 2 kills to 0, 8 to 8, extra camp at the bot lane has been claimed, so that's kind of neat. You can start to take some structures now down yourself, so the Hardos 
are doing their best to make sure that they are drawing even. And of course, with Siege Giants back out on the map, they're going for it too. Bruiser camp at the bot lane. Siege Giants about to be taken. A little bit more top control. Hazu is still playing around those mines. Stacks are coming in. We're seeing them for uh, Rexa now, who wants to uh, get his level 4 stacked. And of course, also the Behemoth armor, the standard talent for Reyna these days. Chris gets attacked. <laughs> he gets uh, takes a beating down here. But he doesn't die. And that's the most important part. But it's, it's still a half-level lead. Still a half-level lead for the 30k lineup. 14,000 damage for Jimmy. 5,000 for Leo. Yeah, they definitely don't have the same damage output now. Now, if they can go on the same target, of course, they can ship in quite easily here. But they don't have that range damage that we're seeing from someone like Junkrat and Jimmy. And both of them just have way superior numbers. But a lineup like this can work. There's the seven-sided strike now. We got the disc uh, as well. And, yeah, Discs is... I mean, any kind of isolation play is really going to be neat for them. If they can make a play around the Disc, that's going to be great. If they can isolate someone with the Entomb, they hold again both of the Shrines. De Quaza needs to move out. Masquerade comes in with the stun. Bad Benny replies in kind. And here's the level 10 for the red team. So both of them now with rogue abilities. The disc connects and they're trying to make the play right here. Bad Benny is the first one to be attacked. Bad Benny has to go for the Kagoon. And Tomb is out. They're trying to catch him again. But Yazu saving the day with the sound barrier. De Quaza nearly got the DK. They go for Bad Benny again. And Ubarak is so low. But they get the kill against not only Maev but also Karazim. Oh my god, what a fight. That it could have easily been one of two kills against the Hardos, but they're able to get two kills. That would... Oh my god, that could have easily been double kill plus Dragonite. Bad Benny was so insanely low, and he wasn't the only one. Multiple times it looked like this is for sure a kill. But now it's level 11 versus level 11. The desperate attempt to get a Dragonite by the Hardos. As we're seeing Dainu holding the top a little bit longer. Thanks to Misha at the bottom. De Quaza had to move back. But he's probably going to try to make a move back onto the Shrine soon, TM. Now that Dainu gets attacked, they need to move them away from the top lane. And it could even be the end of Rexa. He makes it out. Good for him. But in the middle, it's going to be Ultralisk who has to prevent the DK from happening. Yeah, well, over here, there's the five, uh, the four versus three fight. Leo's at the bottom, retaking. If they lose a hero here, that's a disaster. But it's actually Lucio that falls with a good tether into the seven-sided strike. It's the end of Lucio. It's the first kill now. The first kill for the blue team. One kill, two, four. And the Hardos are again being pressured. Once again, we're seeing topside Misha retaking the shrine. Bottom has already been claimed. Both teams are going for the Bruiser camp, but this is another Dragonite opportunity for 30k. 30 stacks also on the Behemoth armor. Pretty good, actually. And they get the DK. Yeah, level 13 is so close, and uh, Lucio wasn't back, so the Dragonite is claimed. And we're getting more of a drain build now also for Leoric, as he's starting to spec into the Unyielding Despair here. Threatening Chris even more. Yeah, they're pushing down at the bottom. They're trying to steal the camp away. They couldn't, though, even with a disc being used. But that also means that at the top we have Rexa and the Dragonite now pushing against only Deathwing. So now the rotation is happening slowly, but that's still a lot of time that they had to do extra damage here. And they're trying to break through the wall, where the rest of the blue team is now busy at the bottom of the map, not only defeating the Siege Giants here, but also, of course, trying to get some more structural damage in. Take maybe the fort out. The fountain has already been taken, which is great when you're fighting over a bot lane control because your opponent won't be able to uh, heal or recover mana. Cocoon has been used. Defensive measure by Bad Benny now. Since he got attacked here. 13 talents on both sides. And the Hados are struggling a bit right now. As the game continues, I guess Jimmy is going to land more damage, but they are collapsing onto him again. They try to go for Nick. There's the stun, but it's always Yasu. The sound barrier of Yasu. It keeps him alive. Here comes Karazim. And they lose Misha. Yeah, good engages happening. A lot of heroic abilities are being traded in these fights, and it's always the Lucy rotation that barely saves the target. This is like the second or the third time that he was able to save someone thanks to his sound barrier. And the damage output is, of course, most of the time chunked down straight onto either Jimmy or Junkrat. Those are the two biggest threats to the team in blue. So they're trying to remove them first. 
And yeah, now we got the Siege Giant stolen away. Nice move, really good by the Hardos. Steal those camps as much as you can. And they're already moving down to the bottom of the map in the attempt to take another Bruiser camp too. <laughs> it's a fun one, it's game five. I mean, again, there's a lot that you're risking if you're going for a lineup like this on the fifth map. And they are still adding experience despite the fact that they're behind in kills. But yeah, it is all about what can you actually pull off here. And now that we're also seeing the quest for Raxa soon completed, means that he himself and Misha will gain some extra armor, and that is gonna be tricky. Nick is trying to escape, and Tomb blocks his path. Didn't catch him, but still blocked the escape path. And that's the fort and a kill. They are starting to run over them. I explained on Battlefield of Eternity how important it is with this lineup that you're not falling too far behind or you're gonna get poked down and you have a real tough time recovering. But they are doing exceptionally well. They are able to take that lead. They are running over the opponent. They're collapsing on isolated targets on the map. And with only two kills against four, they now have level 16, which gives us more drain talents for Leo. He's sitting at the crushing hope. I'm honestly just wondering if he also commits to uh, his level his level 20 or if it's only going to be uh, the burial life. Because this is one of the few cases where I could seriously see both being totally fine. Normally, as you know, if you watch this channel a lot, I hate whenever a Leo player is not going for buried alive because the talent is just so insane. And in most cases, going for something else for the burning despair is just utter garbage. But if you want to do something with the damage output in this one, with a 5-1 melee, maybe there's a chance. But for now, we got Leo dead. They get the kill. Hardos are fighting this out. And they get the second one. They get Imperius. We still have Rexa in the middle of the map. He's not with the fight here. So the red team is just forcing a five versus four and they're taking two kills immediately. There's a bit of damage that could at least be, have been done by Rexa in the middle. But besides that, they are suffering one loss after another and they're still sticking around here. The seven sided had to be used. They're trying to go for Bad Benny, but Karazim doesn't make it. He goes down, he dies and they can't get that counter kill. This gets thrown out by Ultralisk. He's dodging out. Oh, <laughs> Lucio nearly falls here. But the fort has now been destroyed in the Hardos. They might play a game on Razor's Edge, but they are so far doing it successfully. They have retaken the lead in experience. <laughs> it's actually insane. 44 stacks now, also on the side of the Behemoth armor for Jimmy. He's getting serious hit points through that thing. That's 220 hit points in addition to the 200 that you're already running when you pick the talent up in the first place. 45,000 damage for him. I mean, that's doubling what we have on Mayev. And Mayev is pretty... Is, I mean, Mayev on 22,000, then you got 15,000 for Karazim. If you go into a full melee setup, the damage numbers are, of course, never going to be all that high. You don't have that range poke. Which is why if you attack as the blue team, you have to commit. Welcome to one of the problems with that composition. If you go for it, you gotta go deep. You gotta go all the way. Two kills to seven. And now at the bottom of the map, they're desperately trying to somehow bring that back now. And it's gonna be tricky. It's not gonna be easy because it's a huge push. There's catapults, there's two siege giant camps. And they're, they're trying to somehow defend against that. But look at this, they get poked down. The molten flame, the grenades that just keep coming, the shots fired from uh, Jimmy. And they might lose a keep here, but there's the Entomb. They're trying to make the play. The disc is out as well. Misha dies, but everybody else is low too. The cocoon was used against Rexa. Here comes the sound barrier. Ultralisk is low. The seven-sided masquerade is on the move back too. But they're all low. They're getting poked down, and that is the end of the bot lane keep. Crazy good pressure play from the Hardos. So well done. They got the sustain here. And now, they, are they pushing for core? They are. They're just saying, guys, as long as we're healing with Lucio here, you got nothing on us. There needs to be a kill. That 5 versus 5 is a huge problem for 30k. And Mayev goes down. Mayev is dead. The Hardos, they want the winner bracket final. And they're getting closer and closer to it. With Dequaza dying too, it's a 5 versus 3 at the bottom of the map with only half a level missing for the red team to lock in the 20. They're slowly going for the core here. They're burning them down one hit at a time. And this is a disaster for 30k. The combo didn't work when the Hardos played it. And when 30k tries to emulate the composition, 
that the red team played on Battlefield of Eternity. They looked a bit more dangerous at the early stages, but now they're paying the same price. They are about to lose the game. Counter damage is just not enough. And this is it. Our Heroes of the Storm series ends with a victory for the Hardos. A 3-2-2 victory as they move on to the winner bracket final of the tournament.